Good morning, world. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Monday to you. Michael Patrick Shields heard all across the state of Michigan, and this morning it's about control. Republicans making their closing argument on the weekend for capturing control of the United States Congress and the White House preparing for widespread losses tomorrow in the general election. The midterm test for President Obama and the White House seeking to minimize the political damage to the Democratic Party and Obama's re-election chances in two years. They're urging supporters to work even harder to narrow the gap in tight races. Meanwhile, Michigan Republicans hope to score a hat trick in tomorrow's election. They want control of the governor's office, a larger majority in the state Senate, and control of the state House. For Democrats, losing the House would bring dark times, taking away their only position of influence with control for the Michigan Supreme Court up for grabs and polls showing statewide offices like Attorney General and Secretary of State even leaning Republican. If Republicans take the House and Rick Snyder wins the gubernatorial race, it would be the first time since 1998 both chambers and the governor would be in the grips of the Republicans. Now, the two candidates yesterday, Verge Brunero and Rick Snyder, campaigned uh, in Detroit and uh, it was Verge Brunero who told a group at the Hartford Memorial Baptist Church that he was on their side. Brunero planned to visit four other churches. Republican Rick Snyder was campaigning in Grand Rapids. Snyder leads Brunero in the latest polls by 18 percentage points. And uh, Brunero got the support of the Council of Baptist Pastors. That represents about 800 churches in the state. However, Rick Snyder held a press conference announcing the endorsement of more than 30 Detroit area pastors. He did that as a poke in the eye to Verge Brunero because Detroit is a Democratic bastion and uh, Democrats typically receive all of the clergy's support in elections. So very quickly, Brunero's campaign sent out a press release highlighting his support from the Council of Baptist Pastors. Uh, and uh, and Reverend Wendell Anthony says that, quote, Rick Snyder is out of touch with our community. And uh, he didn't like the fact that uh, Rick Snyder wouldn't debate when they invited both candidates to a debate. So we're going down to the wire here. We're 25 hours now before the start of the general election. That's tomorrow, the midterm election at 7 a.m. We are today also celebrating our first anniversary of being on Fox 47 television. So if you're in the area, in the Lansing area, please do stop by the coffee house next door. The windows are open. They're set for a party. And uh, we are celebrating today. One year of being on television if you're in the Lansing area. And you can see us on YouTube as well if you're not. And that is youtube.com slash MPS in the AM. But if you're here in the Lansing area near the state capitol like we are, we're just a couple blocks from the state capitol in the Gillespie Group storefront studio, which is meant for visitors. There's a, a memorabilia area in the lobby and a coffee house with the windows open. You can be part of the show. You can just watch the show or come in and mix with some of the interesting people who turn up here every single morning. So it's been one year since uh, Fox 47 and Gary Baxter put us on television. And uh, I always say that if you'd been watching grass grow for a year, that field would be pretty high. It's about the same as watching radio on TV. That's not true. I thought so at first, too. I said, how are we going to go up against Good Morning America and the Today Show? And Fox 47 showed me exactly how by uh, hiring a group of very talented producers and directors who've uh, mounted nine cameras inside and outside this studio and all around, and there's lots of B-roll and creativity. So try it if you haven't seen it on television. And if you're watching on television right now, thanks for hanging with us for a year, and uh, we'll see you here next year at the same time. It's weekday mornings. Uh, in the uh, state capitol here. Now, just a little bit more politics before we bring in Gary Austin. Um, Brian Kelly has been campaigning. He is the running mate of Rick Snyder. He would be the lieutenant governor if Rick Snyder is elected. He says he's going to play a much different role than past lieutenant governors, and one would presume that Rick Snyder would need him pretty close by his side because Brian Kelly, who was the state representative, knows the political system, and a lot of people say that Rick Snyder's a businessman, not a legislator, so someone's got to help him sort of navigate the waters. Um, Mark Gaffney says that if 3.8 million people turn out, Democrats will win. He is the Michigan president of the AFL-CIO, and uh, he says all hope is not lost for Democrats, but it'll depend on turnout. And there is some bickering now in the race for the races, I should say, for state Supreme Court. Justice Bob Young's reelection campaign is saying that the Michigan Democratic Party crossed the lines of decency by playing the race card in statewide TV ads. Uh, the uh, 
advertisement mischaracterizes, according to Justice Young, the use of the N-word during a conversation that was made public by former Justice Elizabeth Weaver. He admits to using the N-word, just doesn't like seeing it come back in the mirror. And if Rick Snyder does win on Tuesday, Senator Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat from East Lansing, says he might just end up relying on Senate Democrats for key votes. Now, Senator Whitmer from the East Lansing area, as I mentioned, is considered the front runner for Senate Democratic leader. And uh, she's acknowledging that her caucus could get smaller, but the influence could grow. She said she's trying to keep an open mind about Rick Snyder. She's heard from various people that he's moderate, but others have said he's quite the opposite. So once we get the election out of the way, we'll start talking about the leadership positions and the transition team and what happens next. And a little bit later in the program, we'll talk to Paul Opsimer, the uh, uh, candidate uh, state representative in the 93rd district. He's a Republican from DeWitt. Should he win, a lot of people are saying he would be the new House Speaker if the Republicans take control of the House. And uh, Gary Austin at 13 after the hour. We can't get enough of politics. It's our family business. Good morning to you. Well, hi, MPS. Boy, when it's all said and done, when it's all over tomorrow, come Wednesday, what are we going to do? Oh, well, we'll have plenty <laughs> well, to do. That's right. We'll have we'll have plenty of recap to do. You know, MPS. First of By all, the, oh, and let me oh, just remind you too, yes. since you asked that question, we are going to have live coverage tomorrow night, uh, from uh, eight till ten, I guess it is. Uh, live coverage uh, right. once the polls close on this radio station. So you'll want to tune in in the evening if you're in the car, and uh, we'll be able to do that for you tomorrow night uh, yes. across the state. Oh, and and congrats too on on your full year. On television, how about? And the critics said we wouldn't last a week. I said that. And here we are. There were no critics saying that. I <laughs> was the right. one saying that. MPS, your 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 biggest critic. That's MPS. Let's it, make biggest uh, critic of himself. So Gary anyway. Baxter, the general manager of yes. Fox Forty Seven, our Northwood University leader of the day. Northwood University celebrating fifty years of producing leaders, and he leads with an iron fist and a big smile. Yep, and this has and never that's been a pretty good way to do it. It's never been tried before in this market putting radio and TV in this sort of mix. I'll tell you what, it hasn't been tried in in very many markets across the United States of America. It's true when you really that's think about it. That's what I'm told. It. Yeah, they're, they're just a handful. Um, and usually it's in very big markets. I mean, we're talking, you know, top 20 markets where this sort of thing is, is tried. Well, yeah, um, I don't know. Don Imus so. is one example, yep. but he's, that's he's, nationwide. He's, he's, yeah. And yeah. he's, you know, and uh, that Mike and Mike in the morning, that sports show is. But right. by the way, that election coverage will be brought to you by the Michigan Education Association and uh, Martin Waymeyer Advocacy. All right. And, oh, by the way, you know that midnight, that new law went into effect about super drunks in Michigan? Yes. Yep. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago right. where if your blood alcohol is at a certain level, you're classified as a super drunk. Yep. And do you know that it went into effect at midnight and four hours later they caught someone? We already have our very first super drunk. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, the super drunk status qualifies you for a longer stay in jail. That's what it comes yeah, to. 93 days, $500 fine, license suspended for six months. You could lose your license for a year. Yep. And uh, it's not a laughing matter because 350 people died in Michigan last year in alcohol-related accidents, mm -hmm. if you can believe that. So yep. the new law went into effect, obviously, with the intent of stopping that kind of carnage on the roads. In Detroit, Gary, 129 fires uh, over the so-called Devil's Night period over the weekend. Yep. The record, if you can remember that, was 800 fires in one night back in 1984. And what happened to a Lansing man? He was hit by a train? Yeah, he was walking along the tracks. This was on Saturday. And um, boy, MPS will never know if he tried to get out of the way or, or, or what in the world he was doing. You know, in the middle of the tracks with this with this CSX locomotive, you know, chugging down the tracks. In any event, uh, he was 50. He was killed. Apparently, the guy at the controls, he tried to stop, as is so often the case. I mean, you get that train rolling along. You can't stop on a dime, obviously. No. So, in any event, a very sad story. MPS, we have this whole clock change business. It's this weekend. It's, it's coming up this, Fall this weekend. Fall back. We get yeah. an extra hour. And researchers have a new study out. Turning the clocks back is not good for our health, and it's not good for the environment either. Oh. The British Medical Journal did this, found changing clocks to allow more time for daylight in the afternoon could make people happpier and healthier. Makes more sense, right? More sunlight, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. 
I don't know why sense. they turn it back. Just leave it as it is. I know. What's the? What's the? I don't know. They always do it, Sonny. By the way, I just noticed that Amanda Wall uh, this morning is wearing a very fancy sort of uh, evening dress too. I'm in a tuxedo. If you can't see us on television to celebrate our first anniversary, a la Johnny Carson, he used to do that. And Amanda's in a very fancy black and white gown too, shoulderless and strapless. And uh, she's got these earrings, Gary, dangling down, <laughs> and they are dice. To a pair of dice hanging from each ear with little diamonds. And uh, did you get those at Firekeeper's Casino? Is that where those came from? <laughs> yeah, I won them. This is my, my $10 million. That I, I don't blame you. And, Very and good. Diamonds. Well, when Katrine Meadowar shows up later, we'll have to have her have a look at those. They, they, look, they, they look like you could have a crap game with Amanda's earrings, Gary. No, Very glamorous. That, well, you, you have are... to pick on me. Can you, no, no, it's no nice. Money. I'd like well. to take those to Firekeeper's and see if we can roll some 7s and 11s. Well, very good. You guys all Littering, stashed up. glamorous. And for good reason, too. The one-year anniversary for all television. Right. We'll good. have more news. And Ken Dallafor on the Lions. You ready for this? Victory. Gary, the Lions won yesterday. Very good. Let's have an Answer Man segment in the 7 o'clock hour, too, if you would. We'll get ready for that. It's 18 after the hour. Just because it's the anniversary, I think we ought to do that. Stay tuned. We're back in four minutes. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Yeah, and it was a Lions victory yesterday. Ed Sarpolis is with us this morning, one of the state's, well, the state's leading pollster. And Target Insights is his organization right now. I don't know what chances you would have given the uh, Lions versus the Redskins yesterday, but the game wasn't sold out, couldn't see it on TV, so the fans didn't think much of the chances, did they? No, they did not. Uh, but if you actually watched it on radio, by listening, or actually it was kind of cool watching it on the web yesterday. Oh, you could do that? Yes, you could. And it was kind of intriguing to, to see the, the game movement. Fox does a great job on tracks type thing. Huh. You can see what's happening, that type of thing. and you Wow, it's fun <laughs> to see the Lions actually win something and actually may play some pretty good ball. It's like the old days, huddled around the radio. <laughs> yes. Ken Dallafor, who played for the Lions, the Steelers, the Chargers. He's with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan now. Was at the game yesterday and grinning from ear to ear. I would guess, Ken, when it was Indomitian Sue who got his hands on the ball and scored the uh, clincher at the end there. That place must have been going wild. Oh, it was. And, and how fun is that for a big defense alignment to pick it up and, and score the touchdown just to put the icing on the cake for a great win. Pretty good uh, outing for Matthew Stafford, too, huh? Uh, getting started there after his uh, injury. He hadn't played since the first quarter of the Bears game at the beginning of the season. And uh, what, what, four touchdowns? Four touchdowns, 212 yards. And uh, he had a bit of a slow start in the first half. And he was a little, you could see the rust on him just a bit, but adjusted at halftime. He came out and they played really well. In fact, the touchdown to, uh, I started to say Herman Moore, but it's actually yeah. Calvin Johnson on the yeah. fourth and one play. Uh, was just a phenomenal throw and uh, pretty gutsy. Well, that's terrific news. Now the Lions. Um, I mean, wh why? Do you, did anybody find out why Donovan McNabb couldn't be in the uh, in the last series there? Why Rex Grossman of all people had to be the quarterback for the for the uh, Redskins? Well, I, I had heard on a post game show that uh, they thought uh, Rex Grossman could run the two minute offense better, but the Redskins what? are still in the game at that point, and quite a statement by uh, Shanahan to to McNabb and the team that he put Grossman in at that particular point. Unless there was an injury that they didn't speak of for McNabb. That, to me, is about the craziest thing I've ever heard of. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's quite a statement uh, Coach Shanahan made to the team and the organization. Hmm. Well, the bloggers online went crazy about that when that move happened. The Washington Redskins fan says, what's going on? Yeah, it yeah. seemed mysterious, and it, and it obviously didn't work. I mean, no, it was it a not. spectacular disaster. Well, you saw those last couple of minutes with the, the one-yard touchdown and, uh, and then the, the pickup, the thing. So, yeah, it was a great game. Mm. So there we have it. Uh, two and five is the Lions' record now. They're going to have a, a game uh, this Sunday at home against the New York Jets. That ought to be interesting. But uh, do you feel like now we can, we can rally from this point, Ken? You were there. You watched. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I, I've been saying it all year, and I, um, it's not just from the heart, but I, I think we have a pretty good football team when everybody's healthy. And uh, they start uh, – reducing or eliminating the mistakes like, you know, untimely penalties and things like that. They're tough. They're, they're, an, they're a good football team, and they're going to be tough to beat if they play, if they play uh, within themselves and eliminate those goofy, crazy penalties and things and mistakes they're making. The, the other thing that came out yesterday was a couple of kick returns. One got called back, and then one stayed on the scoreboard. But 
Man, we got to tighten up our special teams too, Michael. Was it uh, was it a small crowd? Could you tell that yesterday sitting in the stadium? What was it like? The stadium was extremely loud. People oh. were uh, cheering when they should have been cheering, and it made it tough on the opposing team. Uh, it felt like the place was full, although hmm. when you looked around, there were some empty seats, but uh, not many. Hmm. All right, we're coming into the favorite part of the season for the Lions, the uh, Thanksgiving Day game. And when you played offensive line, did you ever get your hands on the football in your career? I I, uh, I played on the kick return team for the Lions uh, back in the wedge, and doggone if the ball didn't <laughs> come and hit uh, the guy next to me on the foot and stay right there, so I scooped it up and had a big 13-yard return against the Bears and never wanted to touch the ball again, Michael. Is that I your, just want to kill you when you have that thing. Is that your NFL career total, 13 yards rushing? One, one rush for 13 <laughs> yards. <laughs> In how many years? Uh, Ten years. Okay. <laughs> That's like uh, less, less than a yard a year. But, okay, you're in the books. That's all that counts, right? You got it. <laughs> all right. Congratulations, uh, Ken Dallafor. I want to mention um, – Ed Sarpolis, the World Series yesterday, uh, went to Arlington, Texas, and a little bit of politics mixed in with baseball. You might have been able to predict this, that the two President Bushes came on the field. I don't know if you watched it or not, but uh, President uh, George W. Bush threw out the pitch with his father standing there. And here's what that sounded like last night in Arlington. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we direct your attention to the left field gates. Entering the ballpark now. The Texas Rangers welcome two special Texans. We welcome the 41st President of the United States of America, George Herbert Walker Bush. And accompanying his father and throwing out tonight's ceremonial first pitch for game four of the 106 World Series. Please welcome the 43rd President of the United States of America, George W. Bush. Pretty neat moment there, and uh, George W. threw a pretty good strike with uh, very little preparation, and uh, obviously as a one-time part owner of the Texas Rangers, it That's was true. a special moment there. They uh, Rangers uh, uh, shut out the uh, Giants 4 to nothing. so the World Series now is at three games to one. The home team has won every single game so far, and Game 5 will be tonight again in Texas. The big game that you and I usually talk about is the general election. It's tomorrow. And it is 24 and a half hours away from right now. I thought what we do today is uh, offer the candidates one last gasp as we go around. One last time to say why we sh they should get our vote, and I'll get your reaction to that. Let's okay. start with the uh, Democratic Secretary of State candidate, a lady who uh, runs marathons and is running for office, Jocelyn Benson. Good morning to you. Up and early and Adam, huh? Yep, good morning. How will you spend the last uh, 24 and a half hours? Well, we're uh, beginning right now a tour around the state. We're starting in Detroit, going to Royal Oak. After that, heading up to Flint, Lansing, Muskegon, Grand Rapids, Benton Harbor, Kalamazoo, everywhere today to talk to every, every voter about the clear choice in this election between a secretary of state who's going to be on the side of the people and someone like my opponent who had spent 22 years serving corporate and partisan interest, and it's just more of the status quo here in Michigan. Yeah, I saw your schedule. You're going all the way out to Benton Harbor and back across to Ann Arbor after midnight tonight. That's a pretty grueling <laughs> schedule. Well, I'm going to be talking to as many voters as I can um, about this very important choice and this very important race in these last 24 hours because uh, we're, you know, there's still a lot of undecided voters in my race, and we are confident that those voters will come our way, but we've got to make sure they know the choice. I mean, we need a secretary of state who's going to work to reform government in Michigan, stand up to corporations putting out these terrible ads that we're all so tired of seeing, and also who's going to work to stand up and save our citizens time and money. And I've got the, the real ideas to do that because, as you know, I've written a book on the office and am ready to reform our branch offices so that people don't have to wait in line and that people can have multi-year license plates. Okay, you said it there, and you were going to be crossing into the territory of all of our radio stations right now in Lansing and Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids and Muskegon and uh, even uh, parts of uh, Brighton and Howell and out that way. So congratulations on a race well run, and we look forward to talking to you, win or lose, on Wednesday morning, and uh, good luck tomorrow for sure. 
Yes, definitely. And voters can go to votebenson.com if they want some la some last minute ideas and information about my campaign. Jocelyn Benson, candidate for Secretary of State. Ed Sarpolis, does she have a chance? Well, if she does, if the, if the Democratic women turn out, if you look at the vote in, in, her, in her particular case, her race has been within single digit of Ruth Johnson. Her issue has been, is like we've been reading all along, is, is our Democrats going to show up? Mm -hmm. And in her case is that she's energizing the female base of the Democratic Party. If she gets enough under that energy, she could make it very close. But the question is, will that, will that Democrat turn out? And she's hitting all the right cities, by the way, because mm -hmm. uh, that's where the Democrats have been counting in the past, especially in Benton Harbor. There's a good bastion of moderate voters out there. If they, if the Democrats think the race is over for governor because of the wide eight, 18 points last I heard, maybe they don't turn up? Well, that's the why they have people like Jocelyn Benson who has a big future in politics. You have to energize your base. You have to give them a reason to vote. You've got to remember, if you look even past elections, even when Governor Blanchard uh, lost in, in 1990, Democrats still held on to the state house because mm. there's still a reason to vote. So Democrats have to say, look, we may not take the governorship, but we need some as Secretary of State. Uh, we need a state house to balance government. So they have to give out that alternative message. Congressman Mark Schauer is on the other end of our line. He is in a heck of a battle with the man he defeated two years ago, Tim Wahlberg. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. Good morning, MPS. How are you? Good. We thought uh, now that we're, you know, less than a day or so from the general election, the midterm election, we would give all the candidates a last gasp. And now you're in a very, very tight race. <laughs> give us a uh, third. We are. We, we are um, it's going great. Uh, I'm heading to a plant gate, uh, uh, Ralston in Battle Creek. Uh, we make a lot of cereal in Battle Creek. And uh, I've been sensing that people are really pumped up. I was all over my district yesterday. I'll be in all seven counties today. And, you know, as Jocelyn Benson said, uh, it is a choice. And I think they figured out that Tim Wahlberg is just got a lot of radical ideas that don't work for Michigan, whether it's supporting NAFTA and trade deals that don't work, you know, saying he wants to privatize Social Security, his fixation for uh, 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 coming up, having the president uh, present his birth certificate. Um, you know, uh, I, whether people agree with me on every issue or not, they know that I am focused on jobs in Michigan, fighting for what's fair, um, and, uh, and making sure we have an economic future uh, in this state for our kids and our grandkids. Ed Sarpolis, what's going to be the deciding factor in this race? Turnout for Mark Shaw. What's amazing is, is if you look at the last several months, Republicans assumed that they had this race won. And Mark Shaw has run a great campaign. Uh, the communication's been out there. I live in the district, so I get a sense of that. Sure. So you sense this race has really tightened up. Uh, re Republicans were very confident last month they were going to win. They're not so sure right now. Mark Shaw has done a very good job and made this race very competitive. This one could go, I'm going to guess, so uh, well into the wee small hours for tonight. It could. It could. Uh, right. But this is the one Republicans had predicted about a month ago. This is, was theirs to taking. They're no longer saying those praises anymore. All right. Uh, I think, I think uh, things have shifted in the last week or 10 days. I think the debates really mattered where they saw Tim Wahlberg and I side by side. And, you know, we feel really good about it. All right. Travel safely, and we will see you soon. And one way or another, we'll talk on Wednesday morning. Good yep. luck to you. Take care, MPSC Ed. Thank you very much. You Con also saw a drop in some of the ads for Mark uh, Tim uh, Wahlberg yeah. also over the last uh, last couple of weeks. So you sense there's been a shift uh, on confidence that they're not sure they're going to win this. It's, it's going to be close. It could go hmm. either way. All right. Well, well, that's just about the flip of a coin at the moment, or actually the pull of a lever, or the filling in on the Scantron, because uh, we are 24 hours and a half away right now from the midterm election with Ed Sarpolis from Target Insights, Michael Patrick Shields on the first anniversary of our television show on Fox 47. We're back in a flash. We are moving fast this morning. The candidate's last gasp as we're 24 hours away now, just a touch over from the uh, midterm election. Tomorrow polls open at 7. We're with Ed Sarpolis. Nice enough to come in here early on our one-year anniversary on television. He's the founder of Target Insights and a, co a former congressman, Tim Wahlberg. And that race we were just talking about is on the other end of our line right now. Good morning, sir. Good morning, uh, Michael Patrick. Good to, good to hear your voice. Uh, thank you. You too. We are. Uh, how will you spend the last 24 hours, and why should people pull the lever or fill in the Scantron for you? Well, we will be all over this district uh, meeting with people and uh, giving some final answers and uh, final uh, directions as far as where, where we're, we're planning to go if, if given the privilege to represent this great district again. Uh, I'm the only proven principal conservative in this race, uh, the one that has offered the alternatives of an all-of-the-above energy plan, uh, a patient-centered private sector approach to health care, a true reform uh, in, 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 of Social Security to put it back as a lockbox and not a slush fund. 
where politicians uh, like my opponents and Nancy Pelosi can spend it. Uh, we've got to change that. And then finally, uh, to, um, to work to reduce the spending, uh, to put this country back on track, even as our uh, constituents have done. And dealing with their budgets in, in hard times, so you just can't keep spending yourself into oblivion like what's been going on in Washington. Ed Sarpolis, did you notice that when we talked to a Congressman Shower a minute ago, when he talked about the reasons that uh, someone should vote for him, he talked about Tim Wahlberg. And Tim Wahlberg, when talking about the reasons, talked about himself. Is That's that true. fair to say? That is fair to say. And, and actually, you, this is a Republican district. And if Tim Wahlberg reflects the district, then he has to talk about his principles and his values. And because Shower knows that this is a very competitive district, it's still advantage Tim Wahlberg. And so it's going to be turnout. So Tim Wahlberg, yeah, did the right approach here. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to talking to you in 48 hours, win or lose, after it's all done on Wednesday morning. But we wish you luck today. And are you hot-footing it around the district today? We are. We'll be uh, starting out in Jackson and going to uh, uh, Ann Arbor area, Washtenaw County, then back over to Jackson. And then we'll probably hit all seven counties today. And, uh, Michael Patrick, I'll look forward to talking with you and sharing with the electorate once I uh, am given that privilege to represent them again and, and uh, communicate very well with them so they can communicate with me. So I thank you for the opportunity and look forward to a great turnout tomorrow and uh, a wonderful election experience for me. Thank you very much. That's Tim Wahlberg, the candidate for Congress. He was the congressman. It's been a sort of a back-and-forth back situation there in that district. Well, that's been the case going back to uh, Howard Wolpe, if you remember that name in that area. So it's... Uh it's always been fickle. Yeah, it has been. Seems like it has been. Tom Shields is with us here at our Gillespie Group storefront studio from Marketing Resource Group. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael Patrick. You've been paying uh, especially close attention, it seems to me, to the Supreme Court races, haven't right. you? That's getting very dirty, isn't it? Or it has been. Anyway. You know, it really has. Uh, you know, there's a report out over the weekend said about $8 million spent on both sides of this race. Uh, it's very important for both uh, both parties uh, because of if you can you can win everything in the state house or in the governor's office, but if you have a Supreme Court that overturns your your laws, it doesn't do you much good. Plus, there's reapportionment coming up in two years where they redraw the district lines, mm -hmm. and that's really important, I think, to both parties. So, and it has gotten pretty dirty. I mean, uh, Supreme Court races, which usually just be name ID races, now have become issue races, and in this case. Uh, you know, even even racial slurs going back and forth in order to try to win the race is really uh, pretty disappointing, but uh, but very, very active. Uh, stand by just a second, because I want to talk more about that, but we are having sort of the candidate's last gasp today. This is their last shot before tomorrow's election day, and Rick Jones, the state representative running for state senate, is with us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, why should somebody pull the lever, fill in the Scantron for you when they go into the voting booth tomorrow? Well, because they want somebody to fight all the waste of taxes in Lansing, like I've been doing for the last six years. Simple as that, eh? Absolutely. All right, that's a state representative, Rick Jones. He's uh, sort of in the DeWitt area over there, and a heavy favorite, isn't he? Yeah, he's very heavily favored, yes. In fact, his opponent isn't even campaigning, as I no, understand. No, this is, I will guarantee you Rick Jones will win tomorrow night. Okay. Is that is that Joe DeSano's wife running against? Uh, uh, I can't remember. I forget, but whoever it is isn't even campaigning, I guess. Lance Enderley has been campaigning after a curious way that he got into the race against Congressman Mike Rogers, the Republican. Good morning to you, Lance. Good morning, Michael Patrick. How are you doing? You're the Democratic candidate in the 8th Congressional District. Uh, tall order. Why are you? Uh, why should somebody vote for you? A relative newcomer, but y you have been very active uh, for a while now. Give us the reason. Well, it's, it's pretty simple. The people of Michigan's 8th District have not been given proper rep representation over the last 10 years. Just look at my opponent's voting record. Uh, he's continually sold out the votes of Michigan's 8th District for special interest time and time again. I'm the only candidate in the country that's uh, refused to take back their special interest money, even sending it back. So one thing they're getting, Michigan's 8th District will be getting a congressman that refuses to sell their vote. That's right. one thing I'm bringing to the table. Okay, it's Lance Enderley, and we'll look forward to talking to you on Wednesday morning. Win or lose, Lance Enderley is a Democratic candidate for Congress in the 8th District running against Mike Rogers. He may not be taking PAC money, but he's probably doesn't have much money at all, does he? He does yet? not. His difficulty, even assuming this was a competitive race, is name recognition. Without the PAC dollars or dollars like that, it's very hard to compete a long-term incumbent. 
you know, I did see yard signs. That's what I've seen. Yeah, so but that's far. not enough for, for such a big district. And he tried to be a write in candidate, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, there, there was a candidate and not somebody who pulled out, and it was, it was, it was kind of a messy situation. Tough start. Tough start. But, but this goes back to uh, the original race, Mike Rogers versus Bar, uh, Diane Byron. This, is, this race has is, is gone more Republican over the years, and so it's going to be Rogers. Um, uh, Tom Shields, we only have 10 seconds before the break, but when we come back, can we talk about the use of the N word for Justice Bob Young and that? turning up in commercials and all that sort of Absolutely. messiness in the state Supreme Court race. We'll do that. Uh, it's 14 before the hour. Michael Patrick Shields, Monday morning, the day before the midterm election. Stay tuned. So one year on television, Fox 47 in the Lansing area celebrating one year of putting this program on television. You can see it if you're not in the Lansing area on YouTube.com slash MPS in the AM. And since Johnny Carson used to do an anniversary show and wear a tuxedo, I thought I would too. And I know what you're thinking. You knew Johnny Carson, and I'm no Johnny Carson. That's okay. I have a great panel of guests to keep me propped up this morning. Ed Sarpolis from Target Insights is with us. Thanks again for being here this morning. And Tom Shields from the Marketing Resource Group. No relation, because you have a D in your name. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. And you've got the man in the middle here between these two. This is the rose between two thorns, if you look at it, (laughs) politically speaking. (laughs) Thank you very much. Paul Opsimer, who is a a candidate for state representative, 93rd District. That's DeWitt, Gratiot, and Clinton County. And people are saying that if... If uh, the Republicans can, can take control of the Michigan House, you're probably going to be Speaker of the House. Is that true? Well, we're looking at that position, running with that, and speaking with the different members in our caucus. But thank you, Tom. Good morning. I mean, you like your chances, right? Yes, we do, and congratulations on one year on TV. Thank you very much. Are we having a Republican tsunami? I think we are. I think you'll see the Republicans probably flipping the House. Um, Ed is the expert, and Tom is the expert in that area, but I'm going to guess roughly 57, 58 seats for the uh, Republicans in the state house. Ed, is it, is it going to happen that way? It is that close, yes. Really? So I know Republicans have a lock on 53. There's six or seven seats in play, but it's very easy as potential that they could get up to that high. Well, it's going to be interesting because you're going to have lots and lots and lots of new members, and if you are Speaker of the House, I mean, that's, that's a job you may want to be careful you're wishing for. Because there's going to be a learning curve, isn't there? Um, there's going to be a very stiff learning curve. I think that's one of the uh, unfortunate aspects of term limits is that you're asking for somebody, be it Chase Bolger or myself on the Republican side, to be Speaker of the House with just two or four years' experience. And I think if you talk to Andy Dillon, and I think Andy has said many times, his first two years were not real pleasant. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you do differently than Andy Dillon if you become the Speaker and the Republicans take the House? You know, I think part of the problem with term limits is process. We um, tend to want to just push bills through the House. It's almost like group think. Just get it out of here and over to the Senate. And we'll be looking at a better process, um, spending more time in committees, more time in work groups, perfecting legislation before it comes to the floor of the House. Mm -hmm. And do you expect things to be more partisan or less partisan under a would-be Governor Snyder? I think you'll see a lot less partisanship. You do? Even though you'll be in a leadership role? Well, Possibly. I, I think he has no choice. I don't think we have a choice. We need to work together. We need to solve the problems. I think that's what you're hearing when you go door to door to people and you listen to them. They simply want the problem solved. Senator Whitmer, for instance, it looks like she'll be the Democratic Senate leader in in Senate and obviously in the minority. But she said this weekend that she thinks Rick Snyder is going to have to embrace Senate Democrats because he's a moderate and uh, they can help make things easier for him. I think is he a moderate? I think Rick Snyder's style is to reach out and work with everybody. I think he's been on message, very consistent. They all say that, though, don't they? Yeah, but I think when you talk to Rick, when you meet him, when you sit down with him, I think the sincerity of his, I want to reach out and work with everybody, uh, really comes across. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's something I believe. I think he's talked about reaching out to the bipartisan caucus and working with Representative Lease and Representative uh, Bill Rogers. Um, Tom Shields, I said we'd talk a little bit about the uh, Supreme Court race and this business of Justice Bob Young using the N-word. Over the weekend, he said that he thought that the commercials were unfair, that they played the race card. He's the one who said the word. He doesn't deny that, right? Absolutely not, no. You know, he was quoting, though. Well, he was, there was a judge in, in Detroit, in, in Wayne County, who was actually thrown off the bench because of this, who, who used it, uh, I mean, uh, negatively and as slurs and as a you know, racist judge, and they threw her off the Supreme Court. And they were having a discussion in, in private conference in the court. Her name came up. He repeated what she said. And oh. he, so he said the word, but it was repeating what she was said and, and basically and mocking her. And uh, so Justice uh, uh, Weaver basically just, just took that out and said, well, you, you shouldn't be saying this word at all in conference, and all of a sudden it comes that you're not fit for 
for being a, a Supreme Court judge, which is absolutely untrue. I mean, it's nothing uh, less true, I think, than a African-American Supreme Court judge has been the only one on the Supreme Court for the last 11 years, you know, using that term to, to mock another African-American. That just wasn't true at all, and they're taking it out of context for him, unfortunately. And it's usually something that's not necessarily used in campaigns these days, but I think the desperateness of uh, the, the opponents to, to, to Justice Young, in this case, you know, Mark Brewer and the Democratic Party, they decided they're going to play the N-word here. And uh, and see if they can uh, uh, see if they can use it to beat them, and uh, I think people will see through that. The timing of the release of that transcript was uh, curious at best, wouldn't you well, say? She had a four years in her back pocket, and uh, she pulls it out for ten days before the election. So I think it's uh, it's it's rather suspect. The October surprise. Yeah. Well, she cuts a deal with Governor Granholm to replace her. She gets to handpick uh, Alton Davis uh, to sit on the bench and her as her replacement. And then she comes out to, uh, you know, to run this campaign, really, uh, to defeat Bob Young, who's competing against Alton Davis. Candidate's last gasp, Jeff Fernandez, is uh, running for state representative, the Republican in Kalamazoo there in the 60th District. Yeah. Good morning to yeah. you. Why Good morning. Should, How are you? Why should somebody pull the lever for you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm, uh, first, uh, uh, I, I am the Republican candidate here in Kalamazoo. Uh, but I am not running this with an R or a D on my sleeve. I live in Kalamazoo, and it's been a heavy Democrat voting region for years and years and years. And what I tell people is the same thing over and over. At all the doors I've knocked, and it's thousands and thousands of them, I'm running this with a three-way test in mind when I get to Lansing. If, if your bill is good for my family, if it's good for my community, and if it's good for my state, then I don't care if you're Hispanic like me, black, white, green, blue. I don't care if it's Republican, Democrat, Independent. I will vote for that bill. All right, there he Here is. In. Thank you very much. That's a very, um, I think, uh, interesting way to go about it. And we hope uh, if you're elected, you can stick to it. And we will know Wednesday morning. Jeff Fernandez in the 60th District there, the Republican from Kalamazoo. We'll be back with more of your Monday morning. It's Michael Patrick Shields right after the news. I don't know about that business about we're not going to talk about each other. That's all the candidates have been doing lately as we are 24 hours now from the midterm election, the general election. Michael Patrick Shields uh, celebrating the first anniversary of this program being on television. Thanks to Fox 47 and Gary Baxter and the rest of the very talented crew there. Uh, one year ago, I said you're going to put a radio show on TV up against the Today Show and Good Morning America. And it's been a year. So a radio show on TV, if you've been watching grass grow for a year, it would be a pretty high field by now. Hopefully it's a little bit better than that. We sure appreciate it. Kyle Malin is here from MERS News. This is uh, like Christmas morning or Christmas Eve to you, isn't it? The next 48 to, to even beyond that are going to be fascinating, aren't they? Oh, they sure are. In fact, I told my wife last night, i got to go to bed early tonight because yeah. I know I'll be up all night on Tuesday and yep. into Wednesday morning. So i got to get to sleep now. Some of these races could go into the wee small hours and beyond, don't you think? Well, especially the state house races, and I think that's where the focus is going to be. These individual state house races, there's 110 of them in the state, but there's 25, 15 races that are very competitive. Is going to really decide the makeup of state government for the next two years because this is the Democrats' last stand. They have a majority in the state house right now. They have to regain control of the house if they're going to stop this Republican tidal wave and stop Republicans from basically doing whatever they want for at least the next two years. But if you were putting your money down right now, do you think that uh, by Wednesday morning or Thursday, if there's recounts and that kind of thing, that the uh, that the Republicans could control the state house in Michigan? Oh, they very they very definitely could. Hmm. I think the key is going to be there's a couple key races in the state. I think to look at the 52nd House race in Washtenaw County. Early on, it looked like the Republicans were going to have that with Mark Wamet, and then he stepped into some problems with some reimbursements as a Washtenaw County commissioner as to whether he overcharged his taxpayer uh, reimbursements for mileage. And so now that's up in the air with Christine Green. Hmm. And then also in Muskegon, we got a real tough race with Holly Hughes and Ben Gillette. We, again, thought that was going to be a slam dunk for the Republicans, but Ben Gillette is putting up a heck of a fight. And now the Democrats are redirecting resources there, getting him up in the air. Uh, so really it's going to take, uh, if those don't go the Republicans' way, it's going to be very hard. They're going to have to count on a lot of incumbents falling. Um, if not, the Democrats are going to regain control. Susan McGillicuddy, Republican candidate for state representative in East Lansing and Williamston area, the 69th district, is on the other end of our line. Good morning to you. 
Good morning, Michael Patrick, and happy anniversary. Why, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is pretty much your last gasp here. I wonder if... Uh, if you're uh, speaking to all the people who can vote for you right now, why should they pull the lever for you tomorrow? Why they should pull the vote for me tomorrow? <clears throat> I really believe that government has um, gotten too large here in Michigan, and we need to reduce not only the size of government, but also the taxes on our businesses and allow our businesses to thrive again and, and have them employ people. All right. Um, do, do you like your chances? Does Susan have a chance tomorrow, you think, Kyle? Oh, absolutely. I yep. think the, the anti-incumbency mood that is out there right now puts a lot of House Democrats at risk. I would say that Barb Byram in the 67th District has a tough race, too, but there's no reason Susan McGillicuddy can't win. She's got a name there in Meridian Township, and she's really hammering hard on the fiscal conservative stuff, which is playing hard right now. Hmm. All right. Thank you. How will you spend the last 24 hours? Oh, well, we just handed out the last uh, palm card, so my family and I are finally relaxing a little bit. And uh, a daughter's flying in to uh, come in for the election, so, you know, we're, we're looking forward to seeing the results tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you, win or lose, on Wednesday morning. Good luck between now and then. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Susan McGillicuddy there, who is uh, running for state house as a Republican in the DeWitt and, um, as you said, a Meridian Township. I'm still surprised to hear her say she's chilling out today. I would think that there would be last-minute door knocking or something. Well, there could be. You know, actually now is the time where you've kind of pushed your message almost as far as it could go, but there is no reason you can't go out and knock a few more doors and encourage some supporters to get out. This is really... This, and starting about Thursday or Friday, was the Get Out to Vote segment for all of the candidates. You've already spread your message. You already have identified what you're all about. Now it's about getting your supporters out to the polls and voting. Bob Carr is with us, the uh, Democrat candidate for state Senate in the 30, 37th District. That's in the northern part of the uh, Lower Peninsula. We have stations in Petoskey and Traverse City. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, um, why should someone pull the lever for a Democrat in that part of the state? What's your platform? They should vote a, uh, pull a, letter for Bob, uh, a lever for Bob Carr. Uh, I've been around here for 35 years. Uh, I worked for the Office of Economic Opportunity in Washington, D.C., and in doing that, I came back to Mackinac Island to, to look at my roots because I had lived in foster homes, but I'd come from Mackinac Island. And so the lighthouse needed repairing, and I came up with 14 ways to save it, gave it to a newspaper, went back to Washington, D.C. to work on Capitol Hill, and they called me to come up and uh, run the Chamber of Commerce, and Karen, my wife, and I honeymooned all the way up to the island, stayed all winter, and we worked on that project. And I've been doing that ever since. And uh, I, we just don't believe it's just about which political party. It's all about serving our community. And, and so, you know, we've been doing that for years and years. And people know me, and they're going to vote for me or they're not. So what will you do the last 24 hours to uh, get them to do just that? Well, I grew up in foster homes. So tonight, as a matter of fact, is the uh, annual Child and Family Services uh, get-together at the Haggerty Center in Traverse City, and we're going to be there. And uh, today we... Uh, are doing some some sign work. We've we've uh, um, come up with a, a Burma shave sign. It says it's not not vote not for R and D. Vote for the best you see. Bob Carr. It's sort of fun. I did that years ago when when I, when I won, won my primary for Congress, and uh, uh, people seem to love those kind of little kind of things. And it, it's done without a lot of money. Uh, so um, you know, I think a long time services can trump uh, spending a ton of money. All right. Thank you very much. Good luck tonight, and uh, we'll speak on a Wednesday morning. Win or lose, that's Bob Carr. He, he is appealing to people not to vote R or D, but, uh, you know, to vote what they see. Is it possible that we're going to see some candidates in traditional areas that are Democrat actually uh, go Republican and vice versa, maybe in the Grand Rapids area? I think it is possible, and I think you're right. You pointed on the Grand Rapids area. Initially, I was going to say no, but the candidates in the Grand Rapids and Kent County area are actually campaigning very well and appealing to independence. Patrick Miles in the 3rd Congressional District is going to perform better, I think, than you might expect. And, mm -hmm. then, uh, and then you've got the state Senate seat there with Dave Hildebrand and Dave LeGrand. Dave LeGrand also is appealing very well to the independents. You know, that area there, especially in Grand Rapids, Greater Grand Rapids, East Grand Rapids, is going a little bit, nudging a little bit Democrat. They're certainly not uh, as conservative as their brethren in 
uh, Holland, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you may see that, but I think more than likely you will see Democratic areas go more Republican. I think what's going to happen with, let's say, Susan McGillicuddy, Barb Byram, Deb Kennedy out in uh, the Down River area is really going to show us if this Tea Party movement has really caught hold or whether this exagger or whether this talk about throwing out the incumbents was all a bunch of bluster. Kyle Malin from MERS News. You can find it at MIRSnews.com, the ultimate capital insider newsletter. Let's talk sports for just a minute. Greg Johnson is with us from the Grand Rapids Press. He covers the Spartans, and uh, we all went into a sort of a state of shock on Saturday evening, I guess, when Iowa took the Spartans apart limb from limb, starting with the arm of Kirk Cousins, I guess. Good morning, Greg. Good morning, Michael. Yes, it was kind of a stunner. It was not uh, what we expected at all. Uh, yeah, I was with uh, Father Joe Krupp uh, from uh, St. Thomas, St. John's Student Parish yesterday. He was in the locker room and uh, says the prayer with the team before and after the game and rides home with the team. He said not a word was spoken from the Spartans. None of the players all the way to the airport, the flight home, and the bus ride back to campus. Um, do we hang this loss on those interceptions by Cousins? Is that, was that what opened the floodgates? Well, they were already behind 10 to nothing, but they said, so they've had this little habit of getting behind early in games, and, and you just can't do that on the road And then, because what you're doing then is putting the game completely on your quarterback. And then he had probably the worst game of his career. So mm -hmm. there was more timing than anything else. You, couldn't, you weren't going to be able to survive the quarterback having a bad day probably anyway. But to, to add the bad start on top of it, you know, then you're just going to get embarrassed, and that's exactly what happened. They, they got embarrassed. And I think they ran into Iowa coming off a loss, a real emotional loss uh, at home, and they didn't want to get beat at home two weeks in a row. So I think they came out, you know, loaded for bears. So uh, it was just a combination of factors, and, and they just played and got whipped. And, uh, you know, the best thing will be to, you know, forget about that and, and move on. Do they still have a shot, the Spartans, to win the Big Ten title? Oh, sure. They're, they're right in the mix. They're, they've got one loss. They, they have one more win than a couple teams, so they're, so they're still right up there at the top of the standings. Um, you know, they just have to win on out. They have to win their final three Big Ten games, most likely. And, uh, you know, and that's certainly possible. And, uh, you know, that, that's what it is. You, you don't win championships by losing games. So, so they really have to win the rest of the way, and they still have a chance to, to reach their goal, which is win the championship and go to the Rose Bowl. That's still very possible. They need help, though, right, from other teams? Uh, not necessarily. No? Because if they finish, well, maybe. And if they finish unbeaten, the tiebreakers kind of BCS standing. So if Ohio State oh. nudges ahead of them in the BCS in the final, which they probably would, then uh, then yeah, then, then they wouldn't necessarily be declared the champion. So it's, uh, I see. So it's, uh, you know, the tiebreaker in there is a mess. It tags the head first. And they don't play Ohio State, so then they would go to the BCS and then try be Ohio State. But, you know, they really can't worry about that. They can hope that Iowa beats Ohio State. They still have to play. You know, there's still a bunch of games out there, so you really can't worry about the others. you got to win your own games and then see what happens in the end. Ohio State is 11th in the BCS poll, Michigan State 14th. Now, he's Greg Johnson from the Grand Rapids Press. I'm Michael Patrick Shields. We're back in a flash. Well, on this Monday, Monday, you will meet the um, gubernatorial candidates a little bit later. We'll talk to Rick Snyder and Verge Bernero as we're less than 24 hours now before the midterm general election. It's 24 minutes after the hour. Mixing a little sports and politics yesterday, if you didn't see this, it was a kind of a neat moment indeed. When the, the World Series resumed in Arlington, Texas, it's the first time there's ever been a World Series game in Texas there, and the uh, Rangers came in, brought the Giants over. They were down three games to nothing. It was kind of a must-win. But before they got to the baseball, the uh, former presidents, George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush, were brought onto the field. George W. threw out the first pitch, and here's what that sounded like. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we direct your attention to the left field gates. Entering the ballpark now. The Texas Rangers welcome two special Texans. We welcome the 41st President of the United States of America, George Herbert Walker Bush. And accompanying his father and thawing out tonight's ceremonial first pitch for game four. 
of the 106 World Series. Please welcome the 43rd President of the United States of America, George W. Bush. And out the two presidents came on a golf cart with uh, George W. driving himself. The fans went wild. They both came out, and then uh, George W., well, he pitched one right over the plate as they threw out the first pitch, and the fans went wild, and it went well for Texas yesterday, too. They won, so now San Francisco leads three games to one, and game five will be tonight in Texas. Bill Schuette, candidate for attorney general, the Republican from the Midland area, has been around the bushes in the past, and I'm sure he thought that was a special moment, too, for uh, George W. and George Herbert Walker Bush. Good morning, Mr. Schuette. Hey, good morning. Uh, you know, it was a... It was a fun thing to watch on TV and you know George Herbert Walker Bush was a very good athlete in his day played first base and you know, he's you know, a little elderly now and a bit frail but uh, wow. guy's got a great spirit and it was fun to see the, the two Bushes together that doesn't happen very often yeah, and you'll remember, of course, that George W. was a part owner of the Texas Rangers, and so it had to be uh, very, very special. And uh, you, you were, uh, when you were campaigning, however many years ago, seems like a million years ago, and sometimes it seems like yesterday, you were there when uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush was running for president. Well, that's true. Years ago, when I was a boy, I picked up George Herbert Walker Bush in my, my mother's Jeep and drive him around Michigan. That was before it was... You know, he, he was a president before Secret Service agents and all that fancy stuff. So, yeah, I've known the Bushes a long time, and, and uh, I'm, I'm certain that W practiced last night. He threw a pretty good strike. He, he, with very little preparation. <laughs> I mean, he just, uh, he, didn't, he just grabbed the ball and hummed it on in there like a natural. Well, he, 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 I know that guy. He practiced uh, yesterday in his yard. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> Just looked casual. Before the big game. He didn't, he didn't, want, to, he didn't want to mess that up. So practice looking in the dirt. casual indeed. So you're less than 24 hours away now. Shooty on duty is what you've been saying in your race for attorney general. If you can, give us 30 seconds uh, on why people should pull the lever or fill in the scantron for you tomorrow. Well, thanks, Michael Patrick. Uh, and, and the key issue for Michigan is, is public safety. And as a judge on the Michigan Court of Appeals, I've been able to receive the, oh, the good housekeeping stamp of approval from law enforcement groups across the state. I'm going to put public safety uh, first, bring a skill set as a judge that will have me perform on, on the first day protecting Michigan's Constitution. That's it. I'm working hard. We've got, uh, I'm on the five-yard line of Michael Patrick. I'm going to punch it across to, uh, on Tuesday with, through the help of lots of folks. How will you spend the last, uh, I guess it's about 23 hours now? Well, I tell you, we've been, been on this four-day bus uh, tour, and, uh, hey, there's room if you want to come on in. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, held captive by a bus, but Ruth Johnson and I and Bob uh, Young and Mary Beth Kelly and, uh, and Brian Kelly and, of course, Rick Snyder, we've been on this bus across the state, and today it'll be Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, uh, Jackson, Ann Arbor, Arbor, and then I'm going home to Midland to see my wife and our kids. It's been uh, it'll be day four, so I need to, need to get get back to the home fires. Yeah, you have to reintroduce yourself when you get there. Um, you know, it hasn't gone unnoticed that on almost every interview that you've done with me and, of course, other people, you're very careful to mention everyone else on the Republican ticket. You're probably the only candidate that really does that almost religiously. Why do you do that? Well, you know, it's because uh, it's a team. And, you know, I used to play quarterback, and, and uh, it's not about... When, you know, one person's about all of us, and we have a great opportunity to realign or reinvent Michigan. And it's important we get the folks running for state house and, and state senate. And uh, Bob Young and Mary Beth Kelly, I, I think, are very important in terms of having a rule of law judges. So I am very specific on that, Michael Patrick, and I think it's important for the for the future. And uh, I'm a team player. Uh, since you say that you played quarterback, how about Matthew Stafford yesterday coming back after uh, that injury in the first game of the season? A little bit rusty, but ended up throwing four touchdowns, and the Lions went at home beating the Washington Redskins. He's going to be something someday, it sure seems, and he showed signs of it yesterday, didn't he? Well, you know, he's a tough nut. And, uh, you know, when you, you get uh, you know sacked, you got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and then go throw touchdowns. And uh, I like Stafford. He's gritty and uh, that's important to any leader.
All right. Thank you very much. And we will talk Wednesday morning one way or another. But good luck at the election tomorrow, and congratulations on a well-run campaign. Well, thank you, Michael Patrick. Uh, we're going to have a big win, but i um, taking nothing for granted, and I'm not letting up on the gas until uh, 8 p.m. Tuesday. Thank you very much. That's uh, Bill Schutte on duty is what he says, running for attorney general. We never let the birthday of a beautiful woman pass without taking note. And today, ready for this, Jenny McCarthy is 38. Sometimes she's a brunette, sometimes she's a blonde. Doesn't matter what her hair color is. She is a beautiful woman. Happy birthday to Jenny McCarthy at age 38. Little bit of business to do here. The Dow was five points higher on Friday. The S&P lost less than a point, and the NASDAQ was even. Analysts are saying that the GOP retaking either or both chambers of Congress could boost the stock market. Uh, Republicans are viewed by many investors as more business-friendly than Democrats. Whether it's true or not, that's the perception on Wall Street, it seems. Uh, the business climate in Michigan for the second straight year, we almost made the top third in the in uh, state business climates, according to the Nonpartisan Tax Foundation. We rank 17th overall, and uh, that's uh, better than Ohio, better than Illinois, better than Pennsylvania, and better than Wisconsin. In the Midwest, only Indiana uh, uh, fares better. They come in at number 10. Um, a Halloween prank uh, landed two California women in handcuffs. What, you hear what they did? They left a mannequin wrapped in appeared to uh, be a, what, a bloody sheet, and they put it on a freeway ramp, and then they called for help. Uh, they walked into a nearby hillside about 100 yards away to watch the reaction with binoculars. Here come the sheriffs and the uh, uh, emergency officers and the military police, and they found out it was a hoax. Deputies spotted the women and questioned them. They were taken into custody, and now they face the charge of making a false emergency report. I don't know what would get into somebody to think that would be funny to do, but uh, <laughs> they may be going to jail for that. Um, I mentioned the Lions yesterday, and you know what happened to Michigan State, the Spartans. They dropped from number 5 to number 15 in the USA Today. Coaches pull. Spartans are 8-1 and one now. And tied for first place in the Big Ten. And the Wolverines lost 41-31 to to Penn State Saturday night in the evening game. The Red Wings are off today. They uh, play in Calgary on Wednesday, a very late game. And the Pistons are trying to figure out how to win a game. They open the season now with three straight losses. Oregon is number one in college football in both the BCS standings and USA Today. Oh, yeah, and Dominic and Sue scored a touchdown yesterday for the Lions, too. A game saver, a game winner. He put it away late there. Kid Rock loves our Detroit sports teams, loves Michigan, and he's an American, loves America, and he's proud of it. And he's got a new single coming out called Born Free, and he says it goes beyond simple patriotism. He uh, said the song was inspired by trips he's made to Afghanistan and the Middle East to perform for the troops there, and he's been thinking about how, uh, you know, how lucky he feels to be born in the USA he says, look at China, North Korea, East Germany. So many examples of how lucky we are to be born where we're free. Here's a sneak preview of Kid Rock's new song. Kid Rock, of course, from Michigan, Born Free. I don't want no one to cry, but tell them if I don't survive. I was born free. I was born free. I was born free. There is Kid Rock. We send that out to Suzanne Heward this morning, who dated Kid Rock when she was in high school. And now all these years later, he's still a star. More politics to come. It's our family business here on the one-year anniversary of uh, us being on Fox 47 television. Uh, there's a little party going on here in the coffee house. You're welcome to join us. Uh, lots of local business people and politicians mixing and mingling, celebrating one year on the tube. And uh, if you can't see us because you're somewhere else in the state, you can find us at youtube.com slash MPS in the AM. It's Michael Patrick Shields, back in a flash. Live in our Gillespie Group storefront studio, now with John Truscott who was a spokesperson for Governor Angler. That would be the last time that uh, the House and the Senate and the uh, governor's office were controlled by Republicans. It looks like it might happen again after all these years. You know, it you very mean? well could. And, and the way we started, the, the Republicans had controlled the Senate, the Democrats controlled the House. Then I think it was the following cycle, it was shared power. It was a tie. 
And so you'd oh, have right. a different party as speaker every other month. So then on the months the Republicans were had the speaker's chair, that's when we run everything. <laughs> and then took it outright uh, the following cycle. And then uh, now Rick Snyder, that's the best scenario he can hope for, right? You know, I, I think so. Um, with term limits, there's a lot of inexperience. Everybody will kind of be working and kind of coming up with ideas together. And certainly having the same party in office would be very helpful in terms of getting your agenda done. Is it similar to the situation that Barack Obama walked into as president, where he had the House, he had the Senate, he had all the momentum, and not a lot of experience? Right. Uh, could could Rick Snyder be in the Barack Obama hot seat and that uh, two years from now we could be saying, you know, well, you had all the tools, what happened? He could be, but I don't think he will be. No. Nope. Um, and, and the reason is he's been a CEO, he's been a leader, he's got that experience in terms of motivating, leading, directing people. So that's why I think it'll be different. He'll put forward ideas. Uh, President Obama didn't have that kind of experience. He'd been a community organizer, then a United States senator. There's nothing really there that gives you that leadership experience and teaches you how to put forward an agenda, follow through on it, and get people to follow you. Brian Kelly, the running mate for Rick Snyder, is saying this weekend that he's going to be a completely different sort of lieutenant governor if they win tomorrow. What do you think he means by that, and what role can he play? Brian's a pretty smart guy, uh, so I hope that means he has a different type of role, whether it's a little more involved in policy or however they want to shape it up. There are constitutional responsibilities. You are the presiding officer in the Senate. There are certain things that you do, but they could give him a department to direct, uh, for example. It's wide open in terms of the responsibilities that they'd want to give the lieutenant governor. Um, could he be like in lockstep then with the governor, advising him uh, to navigate the waters along the way? I think that would be a very smart move. Um, having somebody come in as governor who doesn't have the legislative experience, doesn't know the process mm -hmm. of the legislature, and it can be a grueling grind if you don't know the mechanics of how it works. Brian clearly does. Having him there uh, as a partner would be, I think, very helpful in terms of getting things through and in terms of the timing and the process. You were the spokesperson for Governor Angler and uh, ran the DeVos campaign and uh, also Congressman Hoekstra's run for governor. Um, do you think that the Snyder, some people are saying a Snyder administration would be sort of um, push the media to arm's length just like they have in the campaign where they don't really answer any questions? Um, a, a campaign is completely different than governing. Is it? And, and I think that... You know, if, if I were advising Rick Snyder and he were able to push the media away and get away with it, I'd advise him to keep doing it. I really? Mean, he's been pretty fortunate that the yeah. the real tough questions hasn't, haven't come in. However, when you're governor, it's a completely different standard. You start with a state of the state that, that lays out your vision. A couple weeks later, you have to propose a budget that's very detailed, line by line, and everybody can look at it. So you can't govern the same way that you campaign. You have to be specific. You have to put forward ideas. You have to either endorse or reject pieces of legislation. So he'll have to take very specific positions on issues. Let's remember we shouldn't uh, put this thing to bed yet. The general election is tomorrow and nobody's been elected yet, which is fun to speculate. In the coffee house, Amanda Wall, the producer extraordinaire for this program with some special guests. I am Michael Patrick. Good morning. We're here with Kim Lozano, the general manager for Citadel, and we're here with Gary Baxter, the general manager for Fox, and we have a special event going on today. Kim, can you tell us what's happening? Certainly can. I know that uh, Gary's been hoping for a box of cigars, especially seeing me walk around with this. I hate to disappoint. <laughs> uh, it is the uh, one-year anniversary today of the relationship between Fox 47 and our station 1240 WJIM here in Lansing. And to commemorate that, I have a little, uh, I have a clock for you here. The inscription reads, time flies when you're having fun. Congratulations on the first of many years in this partnership from 1240 WJIM. And I want to very, very much for this association. It's been terrific. Kim, that is fantastic. Please, I hope the camera can uh, zoom in on that. You know, it has been a ball. <laughs> if you look around, we've got a room full of clients and friends and guests. And I can't thank you and your team enough. Amanda, thank you. MPS, Dynamite. You look awesome. It has been really a joy. So thank you. This is tremendous. That, uh, that clock, uh, Gary, by the way, is set to ring every morning at 4 a.m. when my alarm clock rings. I hope that won't bother you at home. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of this. Thank you. 
you can still get here. The party will go till 9 in the coffee house next door. It's the one-year anniversary of appearing on television. Ruth Johnson is with us, the Republican candidate for Secretary of State. It's the candidate's last gasp, John Truscott, as we move toward the election. <laughs> Ruth Johnson thinks that's funny. I know you've been doing a lot of campaigning all across the state. So here it is. You're on 11 radio stations and one TV station across the state. Why should people pull the lever for you tomorrow for Secretary of State? Because I'm not running on promises. I'm running on proven results. I'm going to make sure we have election integrity, customer convenience, and I'm going to cut costs at the same time. And I'm going to reform and streamline government. And I have signed both sides of the paycheck as the owner and operators, also as a worker. So I know what needs to be done, and I'll get it done. What's the result you're most proud of? You you say you're the you have results to point to. Right. Well, there's several. One, I work bipartisan with two other clerks, the Wayne County clerk and Macomb County clerk. And when I found out that our military men and women that were overseas fighting for democracy didn't have a chance to have their ballot get back in time, we started our troops count. And this is the first November, the first general election, that our troops will have enough time to get their ballot back to make sure that their vote counts. I'm very proud of that and excited. Thank you very much. We'll talk Wednesday morning one way or another. Ruth Johnson's the Republican candidate for Secretary of State. We're with John Truscott, and we will be with Bill Heisinger, the Republican candidate for Congress from West Michigan. As soon as we get back, it's Michael Patrick Shields. Ten minutes before the hour, we're with John Truscott. It's the candidate's last gasp. Let's go through some of them right here. Bill Heisinger has been waiting a long time. I appreciate that very much. I know it's uh, down to the wire here for him. He is a candidate in the 2nd Congressional District in West Michigan, the Republican. Good morning to you. Hey, good morning, MPS. Good to be on the show. Well, why should somebody pull the lever for you tomorrow in West Michigan and send you to Washington, D.C.? Because I'm the candidate that uh, is a business owner, a candidate who's had uh, public policy experience at the federal and state level, and, uh, you know, hey, we've got a mess, and, uh, you know, we've got to get some people in there that understand we need to stop spending, we need to create an an environment for private sector job growth, uh, and that's how we're going to get out of it. So I think that's why I'm that candidate. John Truscott, uh, uh, Bill Heisinger would replace Congressman Hoekstra, who you're very close with. And Correct, that's and, and Bill will be a fantastic replacement. I'll be proud to call him Congressman. Could he last t- almost 20 years like Congressman Hoekstra did, too? Well, Bill's still a very young guy. Absolutely, he could. Are they similar? Um, similar, but yet different. I think similar, yep. some similar philosophical approaches, but, but very different. Um, How do you differ, uh, Mr. Heisinger, from uh, Pete Hoekstra? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I get that question a fair amount yeah. because uh, philosophically, John's right, philosophically, Pete and I are very, very similar. Uh, it's just approach and, and uh, you know, how you, uh, how you sort of go through things and your decision-making process and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're both fiscal conservatives. Uh, we're, you know, we're both pro-life. We're both uh, uh, social conservatives and fiscal conservatives. And, and uh, so we may end up uh, differing on, on some details or, or maybe the, the path and the approach on how to get there. But uh, uh, for the most part, you're going uh, you're, you're to see a lot of similarities. Are you going to have a couch in the office, too, to sleep on for 17 years? Might be one difference. The couch is six <laughs> feet tall, and I'm six one, so I literally don't fit on the couch. And I'm not sure I want to inherit that couch after he's been sleeping on it for 18 years. Yeah, no, I, he said that. Uh, they mid- did upgrade to a newer couch a year or two ago. Oh, so, did they? Yeah, he, he had to replace it after all that. He, he told us though there. that Mrs. Hoekstra said, "No way is that couch coming back to West yeah. Michigan. So it's going to go to the Smithsonian or something <laughs> somewhere. And uh, you know, maybe you need a futon or something like that. But of course, you got to be elected first. So thanks for the time." this morning. We'll talk Wednesday morning. It sounds good. Hey, thanks, and uh, John, good hearing from you, too. You, too, Bill. Thanks. Republican Bill Heising, a candidate for United States Congress in the 2nd Congressional District. Okay, Roy Schmidt is with us now, candidate for, for a state representative in the 76th there. That's also West Michigan, a Democrat. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. Uh, give me uh, 35 seconds on why people should pull the lever for you and elect a Democrat to state representative in West Michigan. Well, I think in two years from my previous experience as a city commissioner for 16 years, uh, I think I came to Lansing in my first year was a, a little challenging, but uh, I think my second year, uh, I think I came there very with a clear understanding of who I represent, and uh, if you want to get something done, you need to work together, and it's uh, because of term limits and other reasons, uh, people just don't seem to get it, and, and uh, I, I've been able to, to work with both sides, and uh, 
uh, I think I've been very effective in that way. And uh, with that attitude, especially with what's going to happen, I think it's going to be needed more than ever. All right. Thank you very much. You have the microphone right now in all of West Michigan. And good luck to you. We'll see what happens. Brian Mishler is on the line right now. We said any candidate could call in. It's candidate's last gasp. But what are you running for and why should you be elected, sir? I'm running for District 8 Ingham County Commissioner um, in the East Lansing area. And the reason why um, we need to change our current government is what's called a supermajority. 13 Democrats, 3 Republicans. And I want to be able to be the person who actually looks at our District 8 and represents the citizens and be able to look at the county to create jobs and keep our, our community safe. And that's not happening right now. And I think we need a voice um, on the county commission. Okay, you heard it right there from the candidate's mouth. Thank you very much for the time this morning. Brian Mishler, candidate. Holly Hughes now is with us, too. She's a candidate, and uh, she is running for state representative as a Republican in the Muskegon area. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. Uh, we have a radio station in Muskegon as well, so those people who are listening, why should they pull the lever for you tomorrow? Well, it's, it's all about jobs, and uh, we've created jobs right here in West Michigan. We're one of the few... Uh, manufacturers that have created jobs in the last year. We did an expansion this year in Montague. Um, it's kind of interesting to watch uh, our opponents say that uh, we expanded in Asia. As far as I know, Montague is still in Muskegon County in Michigan, and <laughs> we're proud to have added jobs last fall and, and jobs this fall, plus the jobs for construction that we had. And I know what business needs in order to succeed in Michigan. And uh, it's not what we have right now. We need to concentrate on that for our families. I'm fourth generation Muskegon County, and my kids are the fifth. Great place to raise children, and I think most people want to see their grandchildren and their children grow up here in Michigan. So um, I'm, I'm here to fight for my hometown, for Michigan, and uh, we can do that with jobs. And we've got to make sure we're jobs friendly, and so we're business friendly, which equals family friendly, so we're not losing our kids to another state. Okay, Holly Hughes, thank you very much. Well spoken indeed, and we'll see what happens tomorrow. She's a Republican candidate in the Muskegon area in the 91st there. John Truscott, we're going to talk to both gubernatorial candidates next hour. Could there be a surprise? Right now the polls say Snyder up by 18. Will it be closer? Um, I, I th you know, it could be closer, but maybe by two or three points. I still That's think all. it's well into the double digits. Probably That's about 15. A, a route and a mandate, isn't it? Uh, it sure is, unlike anything we've seen in, in recent memory. All right, John Truscott, the Truscott Group. Television viewers, thanks for being with us for the last year. Radio listeners, stay right where you are. We'll be back for at least another hour. It's Michael Patrick Shields, and it's Monday. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Monday to you. Less than 24 hours till the general election. It is the candidate's last gasp, and we are heard on 13 radio stations across the state of Michigan. Voters, voters everywhere, and just a few hours left. Candidate for governor, Rick Snyder, the Republican, who last we heard had an 18-point lead in the polls is with us right now and uh, good morning and uh, congratulations we've come a long way from one tough nerd with the super bowl and now your personal super bowl comes tomorrow doesn't it good morning hey, good morning michael patrick it's great to be with you and uh yeah we're just blazing away got the foot on the gas for another day or so here and excited how will you spend the last uh, well less than 24 hours now well we're campaigning hard today we're in grand rapids right now then we'll be in lansing um portland today uh, Detroit area, Grand Blanc, and Ann Arbor. And then tomorrow morning, will you be at the poll at 7 o'clock uh, to vote for yourself for governor of the state of the Michigan? And what would that moment mean to you? Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and actually, the good part is we're going to go a little bit later because then I can actually take my daughter to school. So Oh, a little... It, a, little a little normal. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of balance in your life, huh? Yeah, looking forward to that. Well, that's a nice thing. Brian Kelly, I see this weekend, was uh, talking about the fact that if you two are elected and he's your lieutenant governor, he's going to be a different sort of lieutenant governor with a different role. What did he mean by that? Uh, we're going to try to get Brian much more involved in the, the process in terms of more responsibilities, more duties, more activities, um, because he's a really bright person, and we've got so many issues to deal with. We want all hands on deck, and I'm excited to work with him. Uh, do you ever have a moment, maybe right before you fall asleep, where you think, 
oh my dear God, I might actually win this thing and my life will never be the same. <laughs> well, the second part I know is true. <laughs> um, but the, the first part is, is that's why I looked to run and got my family who were very supportive of all doing that to begin with is I know that the job's a disaster going into it from day one. And it's the right thing to do. And that just gets reinforced every day as I find new problems that the state faces. I believe we fundamentally need an outsider, and I want to be that catalyst. Um, it's not just me. It's a team effort. But we need a catalyst to sort of say it's time for common sense to show up in Lansing and take a whole new approach to things. What's the part about the potential gig that uh, worries you the most? Um, not really worries me. It, it, one of the challenges is, is the transition is just two months. It's very short, yeah. November 2nd to January 1st. Mm -hmm. And to fill all the roles appropriately and to staff things up, that's a very short period of time. In a normal world, it, you would spend more time. You'd take three or four months to do that. So we have a compressed time period, assuming I win, um, but we'll get it done. If you're elected, Rick Snyder, the one tough nerd, will you start wearing ties? <laughs> well, there could be a, a clothing upgrade. That would actually help the economy if I have to go out and buy some suits and ties. <laughs> That's, especially depending on where you buy them. If you, if you come to Casa Checks over here right across from where your office would be, you better, you better bring your checkbook. <laughs> well, we're going Michigan-made, so I'm going to try to make that happen, or Michigan shopping for that. Oh, that's terrific. Well, uh, good luck here in your last uh, less than 24 hours, and tomorrow it'll be of a very momentous day one way or another, and we look forward to talking to you on Wednesday morning. You've been accessible to us all along the way, and I certainly appreciate that. And, uh, and, and there are a lot of people who really almost can't believe it, that you came from, I think originally you were uh, at four percentage points in the poll, and you ramped it all the way up with name recognition. They used to say, Rick Snyder's only problem is nobody knows who he is. He doesn't have name ID. They sure know you now, don't they? Yeah, that's changed. Uh, I like to describe it as the margin of error where we started. Because people <laughs> used to come up. I was actually at two. two. People used to come up and they said, did you know you could be a negative number if you put the margin of error to your number? <laughs> and I would just say, well, thanks for that helpful comment. And just go back to campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Great attitude. That one may serve you well when you come to Lansing here. <laughs> Thank you very much again for the time. Thank you, Mac. Michael Patrick. Talk to you soon. Rick Snyder, the Republican candidate for governor. Jeff Austerly is on the other end of our line this morning, the Republican candidate uh, uh, for representative in the 67th district in Ingham County there. How are you, sir? I'm just fine. Good morning, Michael Patrick. Are those... Congratulations on your anniversary this morning. Well, thank you very much. One year on television and on Fox 47, that's in your viewing area. Are those your grandkids I hear on the uh, commercials that you're running? They are my grandkids. That's a, they were very excited to help out. It's a very cute commercial where they say, we wish we could vote for our grandpa. Uh, I'm especially the older one. He, he would in a minute. So. Yeah. Well, what, what if they do pull the lever, and a lot of other people do for you, why should they pull that lever? Why should you be elected? I think people are going to vote for me because they know that the state needs somebody elected that... Uh, can go to Lansing and change the business climate so that it's more conducive to business and more job friendly. We need to change the way education is funded so it has a more consistent funding stream. And also we need to people experienced in preparing and working with a budget, which seems to be lacking up there right now. All right, we will stay tuned and talk one way or another on Wednesday morning. And thank you very much for the time this morning. I know it's precious. Will you be knocking on doors still today? I will be knocking doors today, and I may even be out and about tomorrow doing a little of it. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff Osterley, Republican candidate for state representative in the 67th district. Dave Agema is here. Agema is with us here. He is the Republican for a state representative in the 74th district. That's in West Michigan. He's a frequent guest of the program. How will you spend the last, what it is now, uh, less than 23 hours? Well, now I put all my signs up that blew over. I think I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> Take a little break here and uh, spend a little time with my new grandkids. Wow. Oh, another man with some balance in his life. Can you, well, you, I mean, you've got experience now. Uh, it's, a, it's an all-consuming job, though, isn't it? It is, but, you know, with everything I've been in, but being a military officer, fighter pilot, airline pilot, you don't need a full-time legislature. All I see is uh, a lot of people making work that doesn't need to be made. So I'm still a proponent of a part-time legislature. Get the budget done by July 4 and get on with life and then go live with the laws that you just passed. You know, what makes me marvel today is 
suddenly it's vogue to be conservative. Four years ago when I got in, I was extremely conservative, and I was ranked the most conservative last year. And uh, really, I, I look at government in a, in a way that most people don't, uh, being a military guy. I think you lose your freedoms one law at a time, and you lose your income one tax at a time. Hmm. I think what lies before us today is two philosophies. One is socialism, and one is capitalism. If you look at history, socialism never works, always promises much, delivers little, and you always end up in bankruptcy and chaos. I think that's where we're headed if we continue going in the same direction we're going. Well, thank you very much for the time. Enjoy the uh, small break because it's going to be back to the rock pile if you're uh, reelected there in West Michigan, and the, the clock is ticking. So thank you very much, Dave Ajima, who is uh, the uh, candidate for state representative in the 74th District. Uh, speaking of West Michigan, United States Congressman Fred Upton, the Republican running for re-election in the 6th Congressional District. Uh, we're lucky to have a few minutes with him this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, my man. How are you today? Well, I'm just wondering, how different is this campaign from all of your other re-elects? How many times have you been re-elected now? Well, I'd like to say not enough. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but I was uh, elected for the first time coming out of the Reagan White House, so I was elected in 87, so I'm looking for my unlucky 13th term tomorrow. Uh, yeah, well, right around Halloween time, too, right? Do you, do you like your chances? What does the polling indicate? Well, our chances, uh, you know, we work to the end, but actually, uh, as we think about our last day and our family, today's my daughter's birthday. Huh. So um, so I gave her a big hug and kiss as I walked out the door, and uh, I'll take her out to dinner after we do a teletown meeting tonight. But we, we think we're pretty good, but we work till the end. So mm -hmm. I'm in Kalamazoo already. It was a great moonscape tonight, or this morning, with the with the stars and everything, but we're, we're ready for a good uh, 36 hours left till the polls close. Okay, all of those years in office, let's just erase all that for a moment and say, you know, I'm Fred Upton, and here's why I should be elected to Congress. What is the reason to vote for you? Well, you know, as I go door to door, as I did this weekend, people often say, you know, we don't see a lot of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. We've made the commitment uh, that we, yes, we do want to be accountable, in a year from now, and you hold me this, to this as well, the deficit better be less and spending better be down as well. I think that that's what we'll do under Speaker Boehner should we take the majority in tomorrow's elections, and I feel pretty good about that. That would be an, uh, a historic occurrence for certain. And there is some gossip that uh, if that were to happen, if the Republicans take control of the House, Speaker Pelosi would retire. Do you believe that? I do. Uh, most when the House flips like that, most of the time the Speaker leaves. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Gingrich, when we lost seats, you remember, stepped down, and of course he left, and uh, so did Speaker Hastert. So yes, if we take the House, uh, I expect that she will step down and resign as a member of Congress. Maybe maybe not right away in January, but uh, pretty shortly thereafter. It's, it's not going to be a lot of fun for her in her shoes to turn the gavel over to John Boehner. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it's clearly a, a national verdict that's going to be coming in, and her leadership has been in question. And uh, as you know, a lot, not a lot of people have raised their hand saying, please come campaign for me, uh, Madam Speaker. It just hasn't happened. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will talk to you in uh, two days, Wednesday morning, one way or another. Congressman Fred Upton up for re-election in West Michigan, and uh, we'll chat again soon. It's uh, 18 after the hour. Henry Yenez will be with us, Jerry Campbell, more candidates. It's the candidate's last gasp. And uh, we will also get with Lansing Mayor Verge Bernero, the Democratic candidate for governor as well, at 18 after the hour, the day before the midterm election. Michael Patrick Shields. Hopefully we give you a reason to like Mondays. We'll get through it together right here on radio stations all across the state of Michigan. 23 minutes after the hour, less than 24 hours. Now, till the midterm general election, Wayne Schmidt, state representative from the Traverse City area, running for re-election. The Republican there, good morning to you. Good morning, Michael Patrick. Great to be on your show this morning. Thank you very much. Where will you spend the last uh, 22 hours now? Mostly in the uh, Traverse City area. As a matter of fact, I'm headed over to... Calcasca right now uh, doing my office hours. I always do office hours first Monday of the month in Calcasca at the uh, Senior Center there in the village. Then I head over to the Traverse City Senior Center and then down to Kingsley, which is in South County, Grand Traverse. 
So that's I, I'm sticking with my plan. You, you know, even during campaign season, it, it's still all about taking care of the constituents. And being accessible is uh, job one. That's not easy to do when everybody wants your ear or a piece of you. How do you manage that? You just make it happen. Uh, I'm very thankful that my wife, Kathleen, uh, is very understanding, and my two little boys, Ryan and Danny, um, they're pretty understanding, but they have the day off from school, so oh. they're a little happier. They were, they were willing to let me go. So tell us why, uh, if you knock on a door today, or you go to a bowling alley, or you shake a hand anywhere on Front Street in Traverse City or Kingsley, as you mentioned, give us 20 seconds on why pull the lever for Wayne Schmidt. Because I've been there for Grand Traverse in Kalkaska County. I grew up here. This is where my family is being raised. This is where I've created jobs. This is where I've served my community, and I want to continue that for two more years. Government must live within its means, just as the families of Kalkaska and Grand Traverse have to, and that's what I'm going to continue to do as your state representative. Boom. <laughs> okay. But that's, that's a little... It's not usually quite that direct, but... Yeah, that's it. A little John Madden exclamation point there for you, Wayne Schmidt. Thank you very much. Travel safely today, and we'll talk Wednesday morning one way or another, all right? All right. I'll look forward to it. Thank See you ya. very much, State Representative Wayne Schmidt from the Traverse City area. Henry Yanez is a Democrat candidate in the 10th Congressional District. Good morning to you. That's the uh, sort of Candace Miller district out there, the Republican in the east side of Michigan and the Thumb. Thank you very much for being available this morning. How's your race going? Oh, it's going fine. Thank you very much for having me on the air. Can you uh, tell everybody listening right now why tomorrow they should go and pull the lever and install you in Washington instead of your opponent? Well, you know, the one thing that uh, people have been asking for this election is, is change, real change, and making government work for them. And that's one thing I focus on. You know, with all the problems that we have in our community and our country, uh, the one thing that we really need to focus on, nothing will change unless we change how Washington works. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go to Washington, to, to do what I can to help change the culture of Washington. Won't be easy as a one person, will it, though, one member of Congress? No, but if we take that attitude, then we, you know, we might as well just throw our hands up in the air and walk away. I mean, it's got to start somewhere, right? So, uh, and it really has to uh, start with the individual. We can't make any law or legislation uh, to change uh, how big money uh, operates in Washington. Mm. It has to start with the individual politician, and I want to be the, I want to be the first guy there. All right. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. It's the 10th Congressional District, the uh, thumb there in East Michigan. And uh, down there into the Gross Points, Candace Miller is the congresswoman there. And Henry Yanez is the Democrat who is hoping to defeat her and go to Washington. John Haller is with us. He is on the other end of our line, a candidate for which office, sir, and why should you be elected? Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm John Haller. I'm running for the 13th U.S. Congressional District. Uh, the reason the voters should vote for me is because I actually have a plan for the city of Detroit because that's what we have to attack first and foremost. If we don't fix the city of Detroit, we're kidding ourselves. And my plan is to turn the city of Detroit into a federal tax-free zone for 10 years. So we get residents moving back and businesses moving back, paying the property taxes so we can afford the police, the fire, the EMS. Those are the vital services that are needed in that district. Is that uh, an unlikely plan? Some people would say that sounds almost like a desperate plan, but desperate times call for desperate measures, don't they? Yes. If we don't get big, bad, and bold, we're not going to be able to save our city. And our elected officials, and I'm talking Republicans and Democrats, in my opinion, basically have sold this country out to China, Japan, Indonesia. We're taking our manufacturing jobs, and we're building foreign countries. That has to stop, first and foremost. Can a Republican get elected in Detroit? Absolutely. I've been, work, I've been walking door to door. I've been talking to a lot of Democrats. And I actually, I'm campaigning, unlike my opponent, who's not. He hasn't campaigned since the primary. Because hmm. he thinks he's already won this seat. Well, John Haller says, let's go big, bad, and bold. you got to like that kind of talk. We sure appreciate it. And uh, your faith in the city of Detroit and what it means to the state of Michigan. So good luck tomorrow, indeed. Candidate in the 13th Congressional District. That's uh, sort of the T Detroit downriver area. That's where I grew exactly. up. So it's very important to me. And uh, we wish you good luck, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Michael. John Haller is the name. Uh, Joe Haveman is a candidate for state representative of the 90th district. That's Zeeland, Michigan. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. 
Well, um, give us your platform, if you would. Why, when people see the name Haveman, should they pull the lever for you tomorrow? Well, my platform, uh, simply, Michael, is that we, we need to take back control of our state spending. We need to uh, get control of our state regulations, and we need to make this a business-friendly state so we can start building this economy again. Well, what would be mission number one, job one, if you go to the state house for you? Well, I'm, I'm going to be uh, beginning my second term, and uh, with, with more control and more experience now, I believe that job one is going to be to repeal the MBT mm -hmm. uh, and the surcharge, and then start to uh, look at our business regulations and our, our regulations that we have on our citizens and our, and our businesses so they can start creating jobs. Any way about it, if you do come back to the State House, it's going to be quite a different makeup than you're used to, eh? Well, I, I firmly believe we have an opportunity in the House to uh, have a Republican majority. Uh, it's going to be a huge swing. Um, we're going to have a Republican governor. It, it, I don't see how uh, Rick Snyder can lose this race, but uh, it's so important that everybody get out and vote. Uh, Bring those, bring those new ideas and those new and that new enthusiasm back to Michigan that we start turning this economy around. All right, you heard it from Joe Havem, and thank you very much. Good luck in your reelect, you. and we'll talk to you Wednesday morning. He's from Zealand. That's the 90th district candidate uh, for reelect to state representative. Jerry Campbell is with us now, and we appreciate your time this morning as we're about uh, 22 and a half hours away now from the general election. You are the uh, candidate, the Democrat in the 4th Congressional District, Kalkaska, Mount Pleasant up that way. What's your platform? Why should people pull the lever for you? Michael, good morning. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Um, there's one and only one reason that people should pull the handle for me. Is my uh, platform is uh, fighting these so-called free trade agreements. Uh, we've been passing them for over 15 years now. We've successfully sent all of our good manufacturing jobs, along with our Michigan tax base, to foreign countries. Um, pretty much everybody you've had on this morning has uh, agreed that the system is broken. But I've yet to hear somebody talk about, well, a couple people perhaps, talk about the real cause, and, and that's the mass exodus of jobs uh, away from our shores and uh, onto other countries. Um, I would really, instead of rather focusing on how to compete with Indiana, I would like to focus on how to get our jobs back from India. I think there's about 20 free trade agreements out there, and again, I don't even like to call them that because they're so unbalanced, that have been voted for uh, over the last 20 years, and I think those need to be repealed. Uh, at least renegotiated to make a level playing field and bring our good jobs back home. Uh, do Once that's done, it solves everything. Do you think that uh, people are hopeful that uh, this kind of, you know, that there can be sort of a positive attitude in Washington? I mean, or, or have we sort of all been so pessimistic about it by now that uh, we say, well, here, here comes a new crop? Well, you know, I hear that from a lot of people. People say, well, how do I know you're going to do what you say you're going to do? Mm -hmm. And um, all I can tell you is that I absolutely am. Um, <clears throat> I've done it in other offices that I've held. Um, there's a lot of people that hate me for it, but, uh, you know, I keep my campaign promises. And then the one thing that we need to do is bring good jobs back home. I'm all for job creation, but uh, we don't need a bunch of $10 an hour jobs in Michigan. We need our good jobs back where they belong. And, uh, it just happened a month ago, as you know, in Flint. We brought our production line back from uh, Mexico. And uh, I say that's a good place to start. Let's bring about 1,000 back. Jerry Campbell is uh, talking like a business-friendly Democrat. Indeed, he's going up against 10-time Congress um, and Dave Campbell. But uh, you never know, and a uh, new broom does sweep clean sometimes, and that's what he's counting on. Thank you very much there in the Roscommon area, the candidate in the 4th Congressional District, Jerry Campbell. Well-spoken message there indeed at 35 after the hour. We'll talk again very soon. This is the uh, day before... The election. We're less than uh, 24 hours right now. There's a big party in the coffee house here in our Gillespie Group storefront studio because uh, we've been on television in the Lansing area for one year on Fox 47 television. And if you're not in the Lansing area you want to see what this act looks like, go to youtube.com slash MPS in the AM. You can find podcasts, uh, you know, of the uh, interviews all over again, put there by Tony Cuthbert at Michigan Talk Network. 
Com. And you can email us there. You can see pictures of the staff and connect to articles I've written, media coverage, and that sort of thing. Our studio hotline is 888-900-9966. We have Facebook as well, too. It's Michael Patrick Shields in the morning. You can get with us just about any way, but keep your radio dial right there. We'll be back in four minutes. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Square, and somebody heard it there. He put it right Candidates last gasp on this Monday morning. We're less than 24 hours till the general election. Bruce Rogers is with us, Republican candidate for state representative in the 34th district. That's the uh, Flint area. Good morning to you. Bruce, are you there? Oh, I am here. Thank you. had a rotten connection. I'm sorry. And good morning. You sound loud and clear to us at the moment. Has your message gone loud and clear to your potential voters? I would like to say uh, absolutely. But tomorrow, of course, will be the real test. Well, if you wanted them to retain one thing about you when they went into the voting booth, what would it be? Honesty. That's a name not always associated with politicians, is it? Well, this is very, very true, but you also have to remember, I'm not a politician. (laughs) Well said, sir. Well crafted indeed. Bruce Rogers is your Republican candidate for state representative in the 34th district. And now Deb Shaughnessy, Republican candidate for state representative in the 71st district. That's Eaton County. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, what about you? Have you turned every stone? Have you done all you can do for tomorrow's election? We absolutely have. I have been working for almost two years, meeting as many voters as I can. I think I've personally knocked on about 7,000 doors. Wow. It's been a, a great honor. When you've knocked on those uh, 7,000 doors, what is it that the people most want to talk about with you? There are two things that stick out in my mind. Yeah. The first one is that they want government to control spending. They're very frustrated about government spending. They have to cut back on their family budgets, and they want the government to do the same thing. The second thing is that they're very frustrated with the partisanship going on in Washington and in Lansing. So they, they well. want us to come up with solutions to move Michigan forward, and that's what I plan to do. It's easy to say that they want to control government spending, but then again, they don't want their services taken away, right? Absolutely. I agree with that. And that's going to be the challenge, I think, that as uh, the next legislature, we have to set priorities. And there might be some things that we're just not going to be able to do anymore if they're not delivering the results that we want. Well, that is tough talk, but tough times, as we say, call for tough measures. And Deb Shaughnessy says she's ready to do the job. She's a Republican candidate for state representative in the 71st district. Brandon Dillon is the Democrat candidate for state representative in the Kent County area of the 75th district. Can a Democrat be elected there, Brandon? Uh, Absolutely. Well, the seat is currently held by a Democrat, so I think uh, it's entirely possible, and I think we'll have a Democrat in the seat after tomorrow evening. And, and what, is the, um, what is the principle when, when somebody hears Democrat? Because we've been talking about this Republican tsunami now, and, and we seem to have identified what the Republicans stand for and that they want to cut government waste and not raise taxes. What do Democrats stand for? Well, you know, it, I think it depends on the area. Over in West Michigan, I think the Democrats over here tend to be a little bit more, um, quote-unquote, conservative. You mm-hmm. know, I've been on the county commission for three years, and have actually been one of only two of 19 that's voted against every tax and fee increase since I've been on there just because, you know, I believe we can't keep going back to people um, who are struggling to ask them to pay more. We've got to find efficiencies and um, fund the things that people care about, education, public safety, infrastructure. But um, after that, we've got to be real careful with people's taxpayer dollars. All right. Thank you very much for that. Good luck indeed. Tomorrow, the uh, 75th District uh, State Representative, candidate Brandon Dillon, candidate for governor, Verge Bernero, the mayor of the city of Lansing, within uh, less than 24 hours now till the election. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael Patrick. How you doing? Good. Uh, they, there were some people along the way who say Verge Bernero didn't have the money uh, uh, to tell his story. Some people don't know who he is. I think in the next minute or so, the Verge Bernero story could echo across the state on all our radio stations if you tell it to us right now. 
<laughs> I appreciate that, Michael Patrick. Well, you know it well. I mean, I'm the mayor. I've been the mayor of Lansing for five years, balanced every budget on time without uh, without a tax increase. We've got a double A-plus credit rating. We've reduced the size of the bureaucracy 20%. We're more efficient. We've laid out the red carpet instead of the red tape for business. And we have the fastest-growing economy in the state of Michigan, seventh-fastest-growing economy in the nation. In fact, Lansing, Michigan was the only city in the state, according to independent research, the only city to actually have job growth in the last year. And as you know, we celebrated with the chairman of uh, GE, uh, General Motors, the other day the CEO of, G of General Motors was in town to announce a $200 million, uh, 400-job expansion. Uh, we're growing manufacturing at a time when uh, we're fighting outsourcing and offshoring, and some people believe that Mexico and China can do all our manufacturing for us. We've grown manufacturing jobs every month this year, while at the same time we're diversifying the economy. We've got high-tech, IT, bioscience, and insurance, but we're not giving up on advanced manufacturing. We're growing that, too. I think great nations and great states have to make things. It's not enough just to consume. Great nations produce greatly, and we're putting the P back in GDP, gross domestic product, in Lansing, Michigan, leading the way, and we've got this automotive resurgence. I mean, it's exciting in Michigan right now. That automotive, you know, I fought for the auto industry, and that investment is paying off. The Detroit Three are back on top. There he is, Lansing Mayor Verge Bonero, Democratic candidate for governor. His story, concise, and as he says, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Thank you very much. We'll talk Wednesday morning, 14 before the hour. Ten minutes before the hour on this Monday morning, Amanda Wall is in the coffee house next door with a couple of special guests. One of them was in a special place yesterday. Good morning, Michael Patrick. Yes, ma'am. Jim Trebilcock from Trebilcock and Danik Financial. How are you? I'm fine. This is the first time you haven't called me Mr. Ah. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, where were you yesterday? Well, I went down to the Lions game to watch uh, watch them play the Redskins, and there weren't very many people there. I think they're probably in the neighborhood of 40,000 was all there were. Wow. Uh, lots of empty seats, but the, the seats that were filled were really enthusiastic, and the Lions uh, started out pretty scary. Stafford was clearly rusty, but um, they came back. Stafford played great in the second half. I think he threw four touchdown yeah. passes. And Dominican Sue and the defensive line is really a force to be reckoned with. They're they're very impressive. How was the crowd when Dominican Sue scooped up that fumble at the end and well, uh, cinched it? I think there's a new tradition. You know, it's going to be Sue. Yeah. The whole time. It sounds like Boo, of course. Yeah. But, uh, he's really exciting. He's oh, just, that's great. He just bull rushes people and just knocks them back with two and three guys, and that's why the others are having so much success. I think getting to the quarterback. Let's hope it's the start of a run, and let's hope that on Thanksgiving, at least, that place is sold oh, out. Please, God. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Good to see you, too, and thank you for the Glenn Fittick that you brought. I hope we have lots of it together. Tim McGuire, there's wine here, too, for him, the ex executive director of the Michigan Association of Counties with Amanda Wall. I do. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. Congratulations on your one-year anniversary here, and you look great in your tuxedo. <laughs> yeah. um, Thank you. And you've been going through the guests one after another this morning. And you know them all because uh, you have to know all the candidates in all the counties, right? I mean, you, you hot-foot it, too, almost like you're campaigning. Well, I, I don't know all of them personally, but uh, we all have some challenges in front of us. Uh, it's going to be a whole new, uh, whole new ball game, I think. And uh, so I'm looking forward to it. And I know a lot of people that have worked so hard are going to have... Uh, be able to rest a little bit after tomorrow. Do you get to every uh, uh, county in the state in the course of a year? I don't know. Probably, I'd say probably about 90% of them. As you know, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, I was way up on the western end of the UP and Ironwood and uh, uh, in Keweenaw and Iron Mountain and Escanaba and I know a couple more that I've forgotten, but uh, it's uh, uh, I do get around. Is a crop of new legislators like we're going to have a pain in the ear for you, or is it a good opportunity? Well, I think it's always a good opportunity. I, I think term limits have changed the way we do business as representing the various organizations like we do the counties. Uh, but I think that it'll, with, the, with the brand new people, it's a brand new slate, and hopefully we can get some things going that will make us a, a, a better state and with more jobs and people with a positive attitude. And I think that's what we need to do, and uh, we're going to work with our organization to make sure that's done. How upset are you that Oregon passed Auburn and took the number one spot in the BCS ranking? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. <laughs> war damn eagle, says yeah, Tim McGuire. War damn eagle is what they say down there. <laughs> yeah. He's quite an athlete, and uh, 
Uh, it's phenomenal to watch him. Although uh, being number one uh, is the kiss of death sometime. Uh, they yeah. were able to overcome that because three weeks in a row, the number one teams were knocked off. Yeah, well, we'll keep in touch along the way and enjoy this election process today and tomorrow. And it's great to see you again. It's good to see you too. Tim great McGuire. To see Amanda. I understand. She's got a fancy dress on today, too. Strapless and shoulderless and backless. Luckily, there's a front. Uh, six minutes, uh, two minutes now left in the program, though. Ted Gerard is with us. He is a candidate ringing in this morning, hoping for your support. What are you running for, and why should the lever be pulled for you, sir? I'm running for the 3rd con Congressional District, and the lever should be pulled for me because I understand it's going to be painful, the changes we need to make, and I'm willing to talk about it. Third Congressional, congress yeah. One of the first things we need to do is put in place legislation that says anything that's sold in the United States needs to be manufactured to meet our environmental and human rights standards, and that right there will turn the imbalance in trade back in our direction. Which party are you? U.S. Taxpayers Party. There we are. We're, heard, we're spoken from a third and fourth party there in that congressional district. Why not? Who knows? It's that kind of year. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerard. Well spoken, of course. Five minutes before the hour now. Kyle Hobrick is with us, uh, the Republican State Senate candidate in the 23rd District in Ingham County. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. So you have people listening right now, and they're going to make a decision tomorrow morning. Why should they fill in the Scantron or pull the lever for you? Well, because if they are tired of high unemployment and tired of worrying about whether or not their job's going to be here or whether or not their kids are going to find a job when they graduate from MSU, who uh, should have beaten Iowa on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they need to vote for me, Kyle Hobbard, for state senate. My opponent's been in uh, state legislature for 10 years, and we've gone from 3.3% unemployment when she first took office in the state legislature to 13% unemployment, and if they want that to change, they need to vote for me tomorrow, Tuesday, November 2nd, for State Senate. All right, thank you very much, and good luck to you. That is Kyle Hobrick, who is uh, running against State Senator Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat, who a lot of people say will be the Democratic uh, leader uh, whether they're in the uh, minority or the majority, uh, Gretchen Whitmer will probably be the new Democratic leader if she retains her seat. You'll all decide tomorrow about these things. And it's been fun meeting all the candidates for their last gasp today on this first anniversary of our television show in Lansing. Thank you to Amanda Wall, Tony Cuthbert, Gary Austin, and you. My name is Michael Patrick Shields. Let's talk tomorrow.